Next, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Nomad. Uh, Nomad, for those of you who've never played with it, don't know about it, is our batch and service scheduler. And so its goal is really to enable you to specify whatever your workload is, whether it's a cron job that you want to run every hour, whether it's a you know, Spark job that it's doing big data processing, whether it's a long running service, and just specify at a very high level what you want Nomad to do, and then Nomad to abstract the details of how to run it, where to run it, all of those details. As you might imagine, for a system that's trying to do all of these things, there's an incredible number of asks. There's so many things people want the system to do. I want rolling deploys. I want blue-green. I want canaries. I want manual promotion. I want Datadog, Prometheus, so on and so forth. The sort of surface area of what people want, because this thing sits so core to the data center, is broad. And so we've been super busy uh, adding all of that. So Nomad, this is just a small set of the things it has gained in the last year. It's been sort of an incredible march uh, to roll out all of these features. And so I'm super, super excited to welcome Mohit Aurora on stage to talk about how Jet.com is using Nomad. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Mohit. My name is Mohit, and I'm part of Cloud Platform team at Jet. For those of you who are not familiar about Jet, Jet is an e-commerce company based out of New Jersey. We are part of Walmart family now. Jet was acquired by Walmart late last year. Our value proposition for our customers at Jet is that prices drop as you shop. So as you build bigger baskets, as you add more items to your shopping cart, our system in real time tries to compute the sub savings based on the supply chain efficiencies that can be brought in to fulfill your order, and we pass on that saving back to customer. To a quick example, if you are buying a shirt at Jet, $25. If you are buying a second shirt at Jet, normally on all other e-commerce platforms, that will be $25. But here, if it is coming from the same merchant, can be shipped in the same box, these are the supply chain efficiencies we are talking about. And the second shirt that you buy at Jet might be $20 because of the supply chain efficiencies that can be computed in real time. So Jet was born in cloud in 2014. And we all the systems that power Jet.com run in public cloud, which is Microsoft Azure in our case. Our journey with cluster schedulers started late last year when we were trying to uh, Bring the, bring the utilization of our platform up. We are trying to drive the cost down. So we were trying to compare all the schedulers which are out there in the market, and we ended up comparing Nomad and some other schedulers which are available. So apart, all these distributed schedulers promise you similar things, but Nomad won for us primarily because of these four things. So first is cross-platform. So we... We, our applications are built in F Sharp, and our cloud platform tools are written in Golang. So our F Sharp services run in Windows in production. So we wanted to have a distributed scheduler which can support both Windows and Linux, and Nomad was the clear winner for us. The second is flexibility. So even though we were big on containers, but we had legitimate use cases where we want to run some workload out from as a general purpose workload on the instances not packaged as a container. And Nomad also gives us that flexibility that we can either run a general purpose workload or we can run a container. Ease of use. So we were heavily invested before Nomad in console. And Nomad and console have same semantics. So we already knew how to run console in production. When we tried Nomad out, it was pretty easy to get started with. So that also played a factor in our decision. The last is the fantastic console and vault integration. As I said, we, were, we had a long list of use cases that we drive out of console, and Nomad has out-of-the-box integration with both console and vault, and that was also a factor when we were making a decision. So after we picked Nomad, we built an ecosystem around it. So we, we never exposed Nomad directly to developers. So what we essentially ended up doing is that we built a tool in front of Nomad, and all we ask developers to do is in their version control system, they check in a file called manifest file, a couple of manifest files. One is service manifest file. But essentially, a service manifest is what your service is, what are health check of its service, of that service. And then the deployment manifest file. Deployment manifest talks about how do you want to deploy that service, if it needs to be co-located with other services, and all that. 
And the rest of the magic is done by this tool that we have built, which we call Gizmo, in front of a Nomad. Gizmo does all the stuff, and then ultimately it creates a Nomad file that it deploys on the Nomad cluster. So when we kind of took this Nomad as a platform, and on top of that, this tooling, we exposed it to developers. These were the immediate benefits that we saw. The first is continuous delivery story. Developers love the fact that they can define how their services need to be deployed in version control system, and then rest of the stuff is taken care of for them by Gizmo, but they can change, go back to their version control system and run the next run of the build, and it will update the configuration for them. The second important win for the, the app dev team was geo redundancy story. So in, in JET, we run services in multiple modes. Some of them we call uh, hot hot, like depending on what it is doing, or hot warm, hot cold. So we, if you are writing a service, it has to opt for one of these models, which, depend, which further defines how it will be deployed on, uh, on multiple regions that we run out of. So with this journey in the manifest file, developers can pretty much define which mode they want to run their service in, and everything else is taken care of for them, and they love this fact. Scaling. So before Nomad, if, if the app dev teams are worrying about scaling, they are worrying about the compute infrastructure as well. So in this offering, what we have for them is that we have a separate process which keeps monitoring the Nomad infrastructure, and if it needs to be scaled up, it scales that up. And developers pretty much have the guarantee that if they need to scale their service up, it will be pretty quick scaling effort for them because the infrastructure is already scaled up for them. They don't have to worry about it. The next is operational excellence. So in the service manifest file, as I talked about, developers can define health checks. We also let them define their pager duty service key. And on, on all the ecosystem that we have built, we keep monitoring their services on their behalf. We have a handle on their pager duty key if it is crashing, and then we, we can page them. So they love this fact that they don't have to do anything. Everything is taken care of on the ecosystem that's built on top of Nomad. The last is the canary deployment and experiments, which our business users love. So as like any other e-commerce company, we run a lot of experiments at Jet. And we kind of try to figure out what's the conversion related to each experiment so that we can run that experiment longer. So Nomad allows us to run multiple versions of the app on the platform. And then we have built a tool on top of it, which we call Phaser, which allows you to phase the traffic from one version to another. And then we do some things at the proxy layers, at the headers, and business users can correlate what's the conversion impact for each of the version that's running in production. And huge win again. So this is how our production cluster looks like. I know it's not a huge cluster in any way. But where we are right now is that we have proven the platform, and we have proven the ecosystem that we have built around it. And it's a completely self-service model. And at this point of time, there's a greater push within the company to move all the services which are not data stores on top of Nomad. And before holidays, the idea is to run everything that we, we accept data stores on top of Nomad. And in early November, I expect this number to be going up close to 400 nodes. And a, as we speak, 50%, we have already migrated the front end, which is a node app for Jet.com on Nomad. And we have phased 50% of our traffic on that version of the application. And before holidays, we plan to go 100%. And all other services, even though they are not serving customers directly, will also be running on top of Nomad. And so yeah, that's it. Do check us out during holidays. We'll have some great deals going on as well. And the platform, <laughs> and the platform will also be running on Nomad. Thank you. Awesome. Can we give one more quick round of applause for Mohit for sharing Jet.com story? So something we've seen over the last year is increasing adoption by, for Nomad, both at you know, small organizations and large ones like Jet.com. And a frequent piece of feedback we've gotten is, it can be really hard to onboard new users onto Nomad in these organizations. You have a core that has operational 
sort of expertise and knows how these systems work and understand Nomad in depth. But for everyone else, it's sort of a new mental model to learn. It's, a, it's sort of foreign when they start trying to learn about the operational side of things. And today, really, Nomad exposes everything through an API and a CLI, which can be sort of unfriendly for some of the users. So to help make that a little bit better, we're excited to have a first-class native integrated UI uh, that we want to show you today. So this will operate very, very similar to the console UI. If you've ever used that, it'll be integrated into the binary. You just flip a single flag, and it'll be served from the same set of processes. And now you get a native experience that we're committed to adding support for all of Nomad's features. Here's just, I'm just going to show through a few of the screenshots of it. It's a much richer interface. I recommend downloading and playing with it. But here it gives you a feeling for what it's like when you have multiple jobs running on the system. And at a glance, you can see what type of job it is, the priority, what state the various allocations of the system are in. On the other side is what we get if we drill into a particular job, if we want to understand what's going on with this particular application. And here it's sort of highlighting one of the features of, that we shipped earlier this year, which is Nomad's ability to do canary deployments. So in this case, the application is sort of canarying one of its instances to run the new version, and it's waiting for an operator to come in and do a manual promotion. So it's deployed out the new canary, it's running, and it's just saying, whenever you're ready, give me the go, and we'll continue the rollout of the rest of the service. And so this is an example of the kind of things that we want to make more visually obvious to users, make it easier for developers who are self-servicing and doing canary deploys to be able to do that on their own. Here's an example of another feature we shipped earlier this year, which is multiple job versions. So now Nomad will track the last few versions of a job. And one of the reasons we're doing that is so that we can show you what's changed. So if there's an anomaly in the performance, the service isn't acting exactly as you expect, or maybe it's acting better than you expect, and you want to know what changed, why is this happening, you can go into Nomad's interface and ask it to basically show you the delta. What's changed between these two job definitions? It might be something as simple as just the version of the job. It might be that the resource allocated to it is different. But now you can sort of drill in and see these versions. And if something's wrong and you don't like the current version, you can push a button and revert back to a previous definition of the job. On the other side, you see what it looks like when multiple jobs are running on a single node. So this is sort of a node-oriented view of the cluster as opposed to a job-oriented view. So what Nomad is doing in the background to increase resource utilization to solve the problem that folks like Jet.com are saying is it's trying to bin pack multiple applications onto the same node. Typically, what we see in most clusters is less than 5% utilization in a world without schedulers. And most of these resources are just idle. And so what Nomad's trying to do is understand what are all the resources available and try and fill that in to get you much higher than 5% resource utilization. And so because you'll be multi-tenant, you can look at an app, and, or I'm sorry, at a node and understand what are all the different jobs and services that are being serviced by this particular node. There's a lot more in the Nomad UI. I only had time to show off a few of its features. It's available now, so please download it, play with it, uh, and give us any feedback you have on how to improve it. Another thing we talk about all the time with Nomad is this separation between the concerns of developers and the concerns of operators. So from an operator side, we'd like to be able to stand up this cluster, make sure it has enough capacity, run the developer jobs, that it's healthy and available. But then we want to be decoupled with from what the developers are trying to do, whether they're trying to submit a new job, whether updating a version of a job, scaling up, scaling down, rolling back. Whatever it is that they're doing, we don't necessarily want to be tightly coupled uh, in this capacity as being an operator. And so while the UI certainly helps with this, makes it easier for the developers to self-service and not necessarily have to understand the whole system, it raises this other question, which is, how do we do this safely at scale? Right? It works if we trust all of our operators, trust all of our developers, but as we open it to a much broader community inside of our organization, how do we sort of do this without losing sleep? So to make that a lot easier, today we're also announcing Nomad's ACL system. This is building on top of what we've learned with Console's ACL system and Vault's ACL system. Uh, and so there's a few sort of twists. It's a little bit different from both of them, but sort of conceptually very similar. At the heart of it is a set of role-based ACL policies. So we can define what are roles for our developers, what are roles for our operators, what are roles for our DBAs. And with each of these roles, to give out sort of these very fine-grained capabilities. So we can decide maybe our developers are able to submit a job and update a job, but not able to access the logs that those systems are generating because they might contain PII data or sensitive data being logged out to disk. So you have this very fine-grained capability system that lets you dole out exactly the kind of permission a developer or operator needs to interface with the system. Those then get tied back into ACL tokens, which can be used to make requests to the system. 
And so because we're announcing the UI with it at the same time, this is natively integrated. So if you're using the ACL system with the UI, developers can put in their credential and just interact with the system like normal, and the UI will take care of threading through the credentials correctly. So that's all we have for Nomad ACL system. There's a lot more detail of it. If you want the gory guts, all of the documentation will be up to date. And all of this is available as part of the Nomad 07 beta. This includes both the UI as well as the ACL system and a lot of other features that is available today. Something we talked about for the first time last year was what we called the Nomad Billion Container Challenge. And so when we were designing Nomad initially, we really wanted to make sure that this is a system that would scale with our users, that they don't have to architect around it. So when folks like Jet.com go from 10% traffic to 100% traffic, they don't have to have that moment of, oh shoot, now we're re-architecting around the core element of our system. And so what we wanted to do was design it with a benchmark, a sort of stress test in mind that we thought was obscene enough that nobody would ever hit it. And so we're like, million containers, no one's ever going to need anything more than this. Let's set this as our design benchmark. And so we partnered with our friends at Google. They gave us access to 5,000 machines on GCE and said, run wild with this. And so we submitted 1,000 jobs, each with 1,000 Redis containers. And so I think you know, at a million Redis instances, we might comfortably have run the world's largest Redis cluster. And what we found is that we could actually schedule all million of these containers in under five minutes. And so this was you know, great. We were super excited that we hit our design threshold. We're like, we never have to worry about it again. Mission accomplished. Uh, and then we got a call from Citadel Group, who's here. They'll be speaking. And they're like, that's cute. We need to go even bigger. Can it do it? And we're like, you guys are you're making our lives difficult here. And so this was really exciting for us, because we, on one hand, we're like, well, no one's ever going to hit this. And then on the other hand, it was this really nice validation that it is useful. There are people who are operating at the scale and need this. And so what we're really excited about today is the availability of Nomad Enterprise. So really looking at how do we support some of these enterprises that are truly operating at this gargantuan scale and looking at their unique problems. So one of the things that became very clear is access control is needed by everyone at sort of any scale. Even if we're operating a very small cluster, we need access control so that we can safely move away from the assumption that being on our network means you're authorized to do things, right? You know, it's part of our ethos around things like Vault that network access should not mean authorization. But going even further than that, what we've heard from some of these organizations is they're not really one organization. They're actually many different lines of business sort of housed under one roof. And so they need to go even further than just having an access control system and have native ability to multi-tenant uh, a single shared cluster. So as part of that, Nomad Enterprise adds the support for native namespacing. So now you can have separate namespaces for lines of business A, B, and C. And each of these things looks like a virtual cluster in and of themselves. They have their own sort of view of the cluster. And so this lets them much more easily multi-tenantly share a single cluster. Now, it's not enough just to split it into what looks like a virtual cluster, because you still have to worry about quality of service. You don't want one line of business to consume all the resources of this shared cluster and starve the other lines of business of resources. So attached to those namespaces is the ability to quota each namespace to a specific amount of resource utilization. So this way, line of business A can consume their resources and do it safely without impacting line of business B's ability to do what they need to do. And all of this is supported with, with Nomad's native multi-region support. So whether you're using Nomad just to submit jobs across multiple regions, if you enable ACLs, we replicate policies and manage those globally. If you define namespaces or quotas, those are all managed globally and support the multi-region setup of Nomad. And so that's all we have for Nomad. At this point, I'd like to welcome Mitchell Hashimoto back onto the stage. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> 